<laughs> All right. If you guys need a Bible, raise your hand. We are going to be in a handful of scriptures tonight, beginning in Hebrews chapter 12. Get that hand up high if you need a Bible. Everybody good? Yeah. Man, good. All right. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful tonight, God. We are overwhelmed that, Father, you've forgiven us, you've accepted us, you've made us fully accepted in the beloved. God, you've called us your sons and daughters, and, and here we are tonight as your people. I pray tonight that, God, you would help us to love each other. I pray, God, that you would Teach us how beautiful your church is. I pray, God, that you would heal any wounds that exist in this room, those listening online right now. Father, the, the woundedness that sometimes we bear as there's conflict and difficulty in your church, God, as sometimes the enemy gets a foothold. Father, tonight we invite you in to bring healing, to bring life. God, to renew our perspective, to fill our cups with love. God, to restore our joy, not only in our salvation, but fathers, we are the people of God, that we would rejoice that we're your children. And Lord, we pray that, that your scripture tonight would speak to our hearts and help us to see how beautiful your church is in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're finishing up uh, our series tonight on the church, and uh, the series title is The Good, The Bad, and I know a lot of you expected me to end this with the ugly. Um, and just as a reminder, this is not categories of people in the church, uh, so it's not, it's not the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, it is the good, the bad, and the beautiful um, and I, I say that because, listen, the church is not ugly. The church is not an ugly thing. There can be sometimes ugliness in the church. And we talked about that last week. And, you know, I'm not afraid to, to deal with those difficult issues that, that sometimes we're confronted with. But tonight, the, the focal point is this. The church of God is a beautiful thing. And there's nothing like the church. There's nothing like the church. You know, it... It has taken a major shift in perspective for me to say that uh, because before I was a believer in Christ, uh, I despised the church. I despised the people of God. Uh, you know, the last thing I wanted to be was a Christian, hanging out with other Christians, singing lame Christian music, and dressing like Christians, dress like. That, that to me was unfathomable. Um, and then I got saved. I know. <laughs> it's so true. Uh, and, and I began to love Christians. I began to love to sing Christian songs. I, I never dressed like Christians dressed. <laughs> so although I have turned in my nose ring and, and my, uh, I know you're shocked right now. No, it's true. Big old fatty right in my nose. But I've, I've personally had a major shift in my perspective, and uh, maybe you've had a major shift in your perspective. That's happened. I think it happens when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, and, and all of a sudden we begin to see things differently. Tonight, uh, there's two things I want to share with you. One is that the church is big, and another is that it's beautiful. So the church, you guys are big and beautiful. I want to say that with all of my heart tonight. The church, the church is big. So when we're talking about the church, we're not just talking about Calvary Chapel, Spring Valley. We're not just talking about the Calvary Chapels. You guys understand the church is much broader than Calvary Chapel. It extends beyond denominational lines. There is the visible church and there's the invisible church. God knows all those who belong to him. And you know, that transcends denominations. That transcends non-denominations. That transcends organizations. And I think it's important for us to remember that 
Because sometimes we get very myopic when we think about the church. Sometimes we can think just about our church, but the church is much broader than that. Uh, the second thing is this, the church is beautiful. In fact, I want to I suggest to you tonight that there's nothing more beautiful on the earth as far as God's creations go than the church, the people of God. In fact, God one day is going to adorn the new heaven and he's going to adorn the new earth with his people. We're going to adorn the new universe of God. That's how beautiful the church is. Um, I'm obviously passionate about the church. And you say, well, of course, you're a pastor. You better be passionate about the church. Um, if you're a pastor or if you're in ministry and you are not passionate about the church, you need... <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There's like four answers there. You fill in the blank for yourself. A ministry is about people. We joke sometimes that we're going to write a little handbook, Ministry for Idiots, and the first line is going to be this. It's about people, stupid. <laughs> Listen, sometimes it's easy to forget that. Sometimes you get caught up in the institutionalization of the church, and you forget that it is all about people. Um, so from a the perspective of somebody in ministry, absolutely, there should be passion for the church. But listen, as a partaker, as a participant, you know, as an individual in the greater body of Jesus Christ, you should be passionate about the church as well. You should bear a passion for the people of God. I struggle greatly when people talk the church down. And look, I'm not talking about, I think, I think it is fair game for us to identify issues. Um, I think it's appropriate for us to address problems. We should be able to do that. If we can't do it, guess what we're going to do? We are going to just continue to replicate those same issues. So it's right for us to say, hey, you know, this needs a change, or this needs a modification, or, you know, uh, we need new wine, so we need to be a new wineskin. But it's another thing to talk down the people of God. It's another thing to use your social media. Don't... Oh. Oh. Don't hate me for this. Don't be a hater tonight. It's another thing to use your social media as a platform to be abusive or to be reckless concerning the church of the living God. And listen, it's a self-indictment because if you talk down the church as a Christian, guess what you're doing? You're just indicting yourself because you are the church. Now, when I say the church, let me sort it out um, because obviously... There are all sorts of things that cross um, our minds when we say church. If you Google, don't do it right now, and don't be watching the Patriots-Colts game right now either. <laughs> but if you Google, the church is beautiful, you'll get 313 million hits. That's how many hits you'll get. And the homepage on Google will be all about buildings. So let me just, let's sort this out. Let me just strip this away, okay? When I say the church, I'm not talking about the buildings. Uh, the church is beautiful not because of its facility. The facility is totally irrelevant. We need to sort out and strip away some of the institutionalism that is um, a product of man. And there is a piece of that in every single church. Institutionalism does not make the church beautiful. We need to sort out man-centered programs uh, you know, we need to sort out methods, we need to sort out styles, we need to sort out the personality and the image of the pastor. That's not what makes the church beautiful. Amen? Amen. Obviously. Listen, <laughs> I say that, but a lot of churches are formed around the image or the personality of their lead pastor, and that is not what, what makes the church beautiful. What makes the Church, the church is that the church is God's people. That's what the church is. Now, now let me go back to the definition that I gave you uh, for the church because I think I, I need to expand on that because there are a lot of people out there that would say, well, you know what, I believe in God and I'm one of God's people, so that does need some definition. And I gave you this definition a couple studies ago. The local church is a community of spiritually regenerated people who believed in and confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in obedience to the Scripture. They organize under Christ and His qualified leaders. They gather regularly for prayer, worship, preaching, and teaching. 
They observe the biblical ordinances of baptism and communion. They're unified in the spirit, disciplined for holiness, and they're scattered for the great commission to be missionaries to the world for their joy and for the glory of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's when I say the people of God, I'm not talking just in a general sense. That's what I'm talking about. That's what the church is. Now, you might be thinking tonight, why are we even emphasizing the beauty of the church? I think it's important for a number of reasons. Tonight, maybe you've come in, maybe you've been burned. You know, I know a lot of people... I did a, a series a, a number of summers ago. It was called, Has Christianity Failed You? And there are a lot of disillusioned people. There are a lot of wounded people. Um, there are a lot of hurting people out in the valley, disconnected from the people of God because they're bearing this burden, maybe watching online tonight. You know, you're, you're connected to the church in the sense that, that you're connected to teaching, but you're really not at that place of exposing yourself to being vulnerable again because you've been burned. And you're just that hesitant to stretch your hand out because you're afraid of being hurt again. Maybe you're a brand new believer and you put your trust in Jesus Christ. You had all of this excitement. There was this um, honeymoon experience that you had with the church. And as you've kind of progressed in your walk, you've, you've maybe realized that it's not what you thought it was. Maybe you've been bearing some bitterness. Maybe there have been some broken relationships and issues that you have uh, endured, gone through over the years, and it's embittered you. Maybe you're one of those people where as you look at the church, this is what you think, well, I don't really like organized religion, and that's how you define the church. You know, maybe you're brand new to the whole church thing, so you just don't know. But I want to tell you tonight that the church is beautiful. Um, these relationships, we are the people of God, and these relationships are relationships you will have forever. Mm. <laughs> Some of you are like, crud. That's a long time, man. You know, the New Jerusalem seems kind of small. <laughs> Am I going to be able to live there without having to see him or her? And the answer is no. No. And so we should love each other this side of heaven. I think that it's important for us to, to consider how beautiful the church is. For the fullness of our joy, listen, for the fullness of our joy, because this is the desire of the devil. God gives you a gift, and God says, hey, this is awesome. It is a blessing. And I, I, I say that a lot of times. I'm like, God has blessed us so much. He's given us so many things. We have forgiveness, and we have salvation, and we have the indwelling of his spirit, and we have the word of God, and we have each other, you know? And we have, can I get an amen tonight? Just like, from everybody. Just act like you're happy about that. And we, and we get each other. Look, there. Oh, you guys are good. Just spontaneous, unprovoked response. Oh, shoot. But, and we've got each other. There's, there is the fullness of joy that God wants us to experience in the church. And so we need to remember that the church is beautiful because the devil wants to rip us off from that joy. All right, and in addition to that, listen, we live for his pleasure. We live for God's pleasure. And the Bible says how good and how pleasant it is when brothers, let me add this, and sisters dwell together in unity. It's like the oil pouring over the beard of Aaron and that symbolic of the Holy Spirit, right, drenching our lives. And so the Father is pleased. The Father is pleased when we um, join together in unity. When we get to the end of this study, listen, my prayer for you and for me is that we would be at this place where we would say, man, not only is the church, and I'm not talking about uh, Calvary Chapel Spring Valley institutionally or just as a local church, I'm talking about the church, that we would get to a place where we would say, the church is beautiful. I love the church of the living God. That's, that's the goal tonight. So, so I want to give you five reasons why I believe the church is beautiful. This is not a comprehensive list. Uh, there are many more things that could be added to this list, but I'm cutting you guys a break tonight, and, um, well, we'll see. I don't know how long this five will take. It, it's, 
you never know. So these are the five, okay? Um, if you're taking notes tonight, number one is intuitive. The church is beautiful because of Jesus. The church is beautiful because of Jesus. So Hebrews chapter 12. And remember, this was the uh, argument of the author to, um, of this book to these people, Jews that had put their trust and faith in Jesus as their Messiah. And he's talking about the supremacy of Jesus Christ and how much more they have in the new covenant than they had in the old covenant. And so this is what he says. He says in verse 22, Hebrews chapter 12, he says, but you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Like this is how good it is, all right? You're, you're on the edge of your seat. You're like, no way. But you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. This is one reason why we don't take the role here, because there's a, a role in heaven. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to all the spirits of just men made perfect, check this out, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So this is what we've come to. We have come to Jesus Christ. What is beautiful about the church is Jesus. And listen, this is where all of the focus goes. This is what we desire as the people of God is that everybody's focus ultimately would be on Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. You focus on people, you are always going to find fault. You're always going to find something wrong. For instance, me. If you focus on, now don't shout the list out right now, okay? <laughs> But if you focus on me and my nuances and the things that you like and you, and you don't like, obviously your pros and cons are <laughs> maybe short on the pro, heavy on the con. But when you focus on human beings, this is what you find. You always find fault. That's why when we gather together, we focus on Jesus Christ. The purpose of the church is to illuminate, to exalt, and to reveal Jesus. When we're in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, guess who's going to be at the center? It's not going to be the senior pastor. It's not going to be you and your ministry and your website. It is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He is going to be at the center of the new Jerusalem. And all peoples, check this out, all peoples will be drawn to him. This is the desire of our heart. Look at we don't draw all peoples to Calvary Chapel, Spring Valley. When people walk in these doors, this is what we want. We want them to get Jesus because Jesus is the answer. And Jesus dwells among his people. You say tonight, well, I like Jesus. I just don't like his people, Pastor. I'm down with Jesus. You'd be surprised how many people say to me, you know, I'm all for Jesus. I just can't stand Christians. Well, <laughs> I'm just, just saying. This, there's a problem with that because, and I want you to think this through, his people are the work of his hands. We are the work of his hands. We are what he has done, and we are what he has doing. What his hand touches is transformed. Read the Gospels. When his hand touches the leper, what happens to the leper? When his hand touches the eyes of the blind, what happens? When his hands are placed in the ears of the deaf or, or put on the lips of the mute person, what happens? When his arm is placed around someone who's struggling, what happens? What he touches transforms and is brought from death into a place of life. And this is what he's done in your life. He has touched your life. His hand has touched your life. He has brought beauty out of ashes. Man, that is a, that's a, an amazing phrase. What, what are ashes? Ashes are, are the leftovers after the fire is consumed and they're good for absolutely nothing. You can't build them into anything, but God can. God can. We bring to God our ashes and he forms and shapes us into something beautiful. So I want to say to you tonight, church, and to each of you individually, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. You've been handmade by Jesus Christ himself. Now look, I want you to turn to the person, as appropriate as this may be, next to you, and just say to them, you are beautiful. <laughs> I 
No, hey, no one's left out. No one's left out. If someone around you has not gotten a... Thanks, bro. Love you, dude. All right, now I'm expecting to have a lot of wedding ceremonies. No, I'm serious. I, I know that I just uh, was used by God for a divine hookup, and um, I'm all right with that. You know, you're going to say one day, Pastor, you know, I turned to her, and I said, you're beautiful, and... <laughs> Okay. All right. So this is what he does. This is what he does. Whatever he touches is beautiful. He transforms our failures and he turns them into gems of glory. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. Someone comes to me, pastor, I blew it. I, I messed up. I sinned. I've totally offended God. I say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to seek his face. We're going to put your failure into his hands because only God only our God, only the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is to, able to take our failures and turn them into gems of glory. You're not defined by your failure. Not only that, but he embraces us at our worst and he sees the best. He embraces us at our worst. Somebody here tonight is thinking, you know what, I'm so messed up, I can't even come to him. There's no possible way in this condition that God would ever receive me. Nothing could be further from the truth. I think this was one reason why his arms were stretched out on a cross. He was beckoning a lost world to come to him just as they were. Jesus said this. He said, I will in no way turn away those who come to me by faith. So he will embrace you at your worst because he sees the best. He has got a plan for your life. You say, what is that plan? Well, we're right next to the book of Jude. So I want you to turn to Jude real quick. Very simple. Hang a right. If you go as far as Revelation, you've gone too far. So uh, this is just good, all right? The, the church is beautiful because of Jesus. Everything he touches is beautiful. He, he makes beauty out of our ashes. He transforms our failures into gems of glory. He embraces us at our worst. Now check this out. This is so amazing. Verse 24 of chapter 1, since there's only one chapter. <laughs> if you're in chapter 2 of the book of Jude, turn your Bible over to us. We'll give you a different one. Okay, it's, 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 It says this. It says, and you got to catch it, not to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is what he's going to do. This is what he's going to do. He one day is going to present you. We're going to talk about this in just a second. He's going to present you before the Father faultless and with exceeding joy. What's beautiful about the church is Jesus. What's beautiful about the church is the church is the body of Christ. Turn to the book of Ephesians tonight. Just a couple of verses, so hang in there. Chapter 4. What's beautiful about the church is the church is the people of God are the body of Christ. There's one body. And the Bible says this in verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, this is Paul speaking or writing, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lonely, lowliness, <laughs> loneliness, no, no, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then he says this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So I want you to notice here the oneness, the community of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. There's one body. Now, now um, his body needs to be handled with care. His body needs to be handled with care. I think about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus as they took the physical body of Christ off the cross. You know, they handled, 
picture that. What was that like? They handled that body with care. And the next day after the Sabbath was over, remember the women were prepared to go and to prepare that body in a more complete sense for burial. There was a there was a, a care they took with the body of Christ. Now, we being the body of Christ, obviously, there's a different meaning because Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God the Father. But we are his body, and this is what that means. It means that he now is living through the physical presence of his people. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. Have you pictured this before? Jesus, via his Holy Spirit, indwells every one of us. And he lives through us, every one of us who um, knows him, who's believed in the gospel, he lives through our physical presence, and that brings his presence into this world. We together as the body of Christ, I'm, I'm saying tonight, this transcends individualism, okay? The picture here is a united body, each part tied together. We're going to see this in a minute, knit together by tendons and ligaments. There's a oneness. There's a community that we have. And this is hard for us because we're, we're post-enlightenment people. And our theology has been affected by the enlightenment. And so there is a tendency to emphasize, this is what I mean by that, there is a tendency to emphasize individualism over community in our theology. Because we're post-enlightenment, the exaltation of man, we have a tendency to, to um, emphasize individualism over community. You know, if you go back and, and you listen to some of the music that was written pre-enlightenment, a lot of it was Gregorian chants. I'm not sure if you like Gregorian chants or not, but I do. Can I make that confession to you today? Don't judge me for it. I told you <laughs> there'd be something that you didn't like. But what's amazing about Gregorian music is this. There's a multitude of voices, all right? There's a multitude of voices that are beautifully arranged so that in, their, in the multitude of them, it only sounds as if it's one voice, okay? So, so a multitude of individuals arranged together, so that what you hear sounds almost as if it is just one single voice. Contrast that, and I don't mean this necessarily in a negative sense, but contrast that to music, Christian music today, where there is such an emphasis on individualism and solos and things like that. There is, there is a loss of interconnectedness. There is a loss of oneness. There is a loss of the communion of saints that God intends us to experience because we have the tendency to emphasize the individual over the community. And the whole picture of the body of Christ is this. We're no longer really individuals. We are all tied and connected together as one. Paul, I believe, was referring to this when he said this to the church at Colossae. He said, hold fast to the head. Of course, we know that's Jesus Christ from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. So he's saying that we're all intricately tied together. And if you think this through, that also means dysfunction and division in the church comes at a cost to everybody. Dysfunction and division in the church comes at a cost to everybody. Paul he was uh, writing to the churches in the area of Galatia. He said this, If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed. So if you bite and devour each other, beware lest you all be consumed. In other words, what you do affects everybody. And so since we are the body of Christ, the church needs to be handled with care. The church needs to be treated I'm talking about the church of the living God needs to be treated with love and respect. The church is beautiful because it's the bride of Christ. Hang a right to the book of Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Beginning in verse 7, the Bible says this. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her... 
It was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So we are, certainly there are other scriptures. We are, this is beautiful, we are the bride of Christ. Why a bride? Why a bride? I think that there's no greater expression of intimacy, affection, fidelity, um, and lovingness in a relationship. I think that that's what that uh, is expressed as we are, in a sense, metaphorically spoken of as the bride of Christ. There's no greater expression of intimacy, affection, fidelity. There's no uh, greater or higher level of loving relationship than the marriage relationship. When you think of a bride, what do you think of? Yes, thank you very much. I love you for being so on tonight. That's what you think of. I think of my wife on our wedding day. Let me tell you something. I know. She was radiant. She was glorious. She still is, by the way. She just gets more radiant and more glorious. I fully married up, and I have no problem. You know, my wife, she was one of those people. She used to go, and if she saw like a stray dog or an injured critter, she'd go and collect it and take care of it. I'm like, babe, that's what you did with me, you know, like this stray, <laughs> nasty, injured critter. And, um, you know, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I, I can still see her, like in my mind, in my heart's eye. On that day, she was beaming. She was beautiful. Every bride is beautiful. And on that day, Jesus is going to present you as his bride to the Father, clothed in white, holy, pure, radiant. Okay, this is reality, church, reality check. This is your reality. You say, I just want to know what's going to happen in my future. Here it is. One day you're going to be presented. Christ himself is going to say to the Father, this is my bride. Isn't she beautiful? Isn't she glorious? Don't sing the Stevie Wonder song right now. Isn't she radiating glory and beauty, clothed in white, holy and pure? Now listen, you've got to keep that in mind. You have to keep that in mind. You've got to keep the end in mind because when you keep that in mind, it helps you live like life like you're supposed to live it in this life, okay? If, if I'm the bride of Christ and he's going to present me one day before the Father, I want to live now like I'm going to experience that then. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then not only that, it helps us see each other like we're supposed to see each other. So it's not just about me. It's not just about my own little individual experience. Guess what? You're the bride of Christ too. You're the bride of Christ. And one day some dudes are like, don't you call me bride of Christ. <laughs> I'll kill you, pastor. <laughs> Get over it, manly man with your flannel and your gun rack and your fat beard. Listen, listen, bride boy. <laughs> You're the bride. <laughs> you are the bride of Christ. And, and this is what a, a godly man does. A godly man says, yes, amen. I'm all over that. I am the bride of Christ. I've got no problems with that. I've got no problems. This is not just me individually, this is you too. So, so this is how I see you, brothers and sisters. You are the bride of Christ. You're going to be presented one day, beautifully, pure, holy, radiant. This is what God is doing in your life. We need to remember the work of God in each other's lives. We are oftentimes too quick to criticize. Sometimes we view each other like, like we are each other's projects. Like, you know, I see some issues here, so I'm going to fix him or I'm going to fix her. Guess what? Hands off. The Holy Spirit does the fixing. Put the hammer and chisel away. No one else needs to be made in your image, okay? It's enough having one of you. Seriously. God spoke this to me years ago with Rachel. You know, I was praying for her. I was struggling with some stuff. And, and I was in a time of prayer, and, he, and I was reading through the Old Testament, and God was instructing Moses on the altar. And he says, don't you touch it with hammer and chisel. Hands off. Just put the rocks together. And God spoke to me, and he said, you are not going to make your wife into your image. I am making her into my image. So put down the hammer. 
put down the chisel, and you worry about yourself, I'll take care of her. And we need to remember that in the church. We're not each other's projects. If we really want to be involved in each other's life, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's not a place for accountability. I'm not saying there's not a place for lovingly sharing the truth, but we better be led by God. We better be led by God. We better not be led by, by a critical spirit. We better not be led by this attitude that we've got it all together and we're gonna fix everybody else. Let the Holy Spirit do the fixing because no one fixes people like the Holy Spirit. Not only that, listen, he protects his bride. I mean, what groom would say, hey, you can talk to my bride however you want to. I could care less. Treat her however you want. I don't think so. Mess with me, I'm all right with that. Mess with my wife, I'm not all right with that. I'm not all right with that. And if you're a husband that is all right with that, you've got serious problems. Talk to Pastor Mike after the service tonight. <laughs> but this is what he does. He protects his bride. And he takes it personally. He takes it personally. He said to Saul, and I know that we're dealing with a non-believer here at this point, but he said to Saul, why are you persecuting me? This offense is not just to my people. This is, again, I'm taking this personal like and then in the book of Revelation, you see the tribulation saints, they say to him, they say, how long, O Lord, until you avenge? And this is what he says, just a little bit longer. You hang out, you hang out, because I'm going to deal with this issue. So what am I saying? I'm saying don't ever put yourself in a place where you're being reckless with God's people. Don't ever find yourself in a place where you are being reckless with the bride of Christ. Because he, this is going to sound heavy, he takes it personally, and he won't tolerate it. And, and I think that through. Honestly, this is, a, this is a strong motivation for me to treat brothers and sisters the way they ought to be treated, a holy fear of God. There's nothing wrong with that. The church is beautiful because it's the bride of Christ. The fourth thing, if you're taking notes tonight, the church is beautiful because it's the family of God. Turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, I'm hanging out at the end part of here of the New Testament just to make it easy on you guys. You can thank me later. Put that in the pro column, please. All right, this is what he says. He says, behold, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Behold what manner, let me, let me translate that, okay? He's like, what? That's what he's saying in the English, literally. What? Are you kidding me? No, this is blowing my mind. This is what John is saying. 60 years walking with the Lord, and he says, behold, this is crazy. This is going to, this is going to blow you up. This is out of this world. Check this out. The manner of love that God has bestowed upon us that we should be called his sons and daughters. What? Excuse me? We've been brought into the family of God. Does that still blow you away? Yes. Does that still bless your heart? Yes. All right, that's awesome. Like four people <laughs> here in the front. You're like, no, nope, not really. What's point five, pastor? <laughs> 60 years of walking with Jesus. 60 years later, look, it was like fresh. It was raw. It wasn't old news to him because John never lost sight of the cross. And he was still in that place where it's like, man, somebody pinch me. Of course, he was, you know, a very pinchable guy <laughs> with his flannel and his big beard. But, but he was still in this place where it was so real and so raw and so beautiful, look, I think that he's saying this, this is so beautiful, this is gonna blow your mind, the love of God, that he's adopted us, that he has brought us in. Jesus said this, he said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and my sisters? This is who, whoever does the will of my father. Think about this, Jesus Christ has brought you in, he has embraced you into his family. Now listen, every family has their Uncle Fester's. Okay? And I have to tell you, I love the Uncle Festers and the body of Christ. It is what keeps the church interesting. Look how diverse 
don't look right now, but think about <laughs> how diverse the church is. This is, this is a my church experience in, uh, in Las Vegas. I think we have one of the most diverse churches. I, we are all over the map, and I, I love how all over the map we are. Um, educationally, socioeconomically, um, politically, all over the map. Mentally, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, we're all shapes and sizes, ethnicities. I love the diversity of the body of Christ and the uniquenesses. Thank God we all don't look alike. Thank God we don't all talk alike. Thank God we all don't dress alike. Because the uniqueness of the body of Christ, what it does, it, all it does is it is an illustration that Jesus Christ is at our center and he is the one that draws us together. The church is the family of God. The fifth and final thing is this. The church is beautiful in God's eyes. Acts chapter 20. Last thing tonight, I want you to turn there. Eyes on. Acts chapter 20. We're going to tie this study off with this verse and... Um, it's one of my favorite verses. We, we read it last week, and Paul, of course, um, at Miletus, all the elders from Ephesus had come to him. Last time that he was going to see them face to face, there was a lot of weeping, a lot of, um, a lot of brokenness, a lot of sadness, because they were going to miss Paul, and he exhorted them with many words. But I want you to note what he said in verse 28. He said this, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That's, that's heavy. Like you want something, you want a verse that's really going to create in your heart value for God's people. Look, if this doesn't do it, you gotta, you'd have to ask yourself whether or not you're really part of God's church. I mean, think about how profound this is. Therefore, take heed to yourselves, to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, this is powerful, which he purchased with his own blood. The church is not a common thing. The church is not a common thing. You know, the price you pay for something expresses how much of a value it is to you. And this is what God says. God says, hey, I'm, I'm willing to go all the way. I'm willing to go all the way. There's no price too high that I won't pay it. As he, in eternity past, saw your redemption and the forgiveness of your sins and your adoption into his family, this is what he said, nothing is going to stop me from that happening. And he purchased it with the blood of his own son. How far did he go? That's how far he went. We're going to take communion tonight. Communion is not just part of some institutionalism of the church. Like we're remembering what he did for us, his body that was broken, his blood that was shed. We're proclaiming his death until he comes. We have communion, we have unity, we have oneness with God the Father through his Son. But we also, communion is also this, we have community, we have oneness, we have communion with each other. We are all together eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. And that's what binds the church of the living God together. That's what binds us together. It is the person of Jesus Christ. And so tonight, listen, we need to see each other as God sees us. We need to remember the work of God in each other's lives. We're all on a journey. We're all in process. We need to be a positive part of that, lifting each other up, and provoking each other to pursue God with all of our hearts. Uh, we need to be a source of encouragement, edification, building up the body of Christ. We need to remember that the church of God is beautiful. It's beautiful in his eyes, and it should be beautiful in our eyes as well. Amen? All right, so post that on your Facebook tonight, okay? No, I'm not kidding. Not right now. This is what you're going to do, Facebookers. Twitter people, Instagram, whatever you use, I want you to post that tonight. The church of the living God is beautiful, all right? Father, we're in love with you, God. We are in love with you. We want to love you with more of our hearts, God. You're so worthy. You're so deserving. God, this, this thing that we call the church, your people, it is beautiful, 
It's beautiful because of your son. It's beautiful because whatever he touches turns from death to life. God, tonight we're, we're beautiful because we're the body of Christ, we're the bride of Christ, we're the family of God. We have immense value in your sight. And God, I pray for those among us who are struggling and God, those may be battling, hating themselves, allowing their lives to be defined by failure and sin, beat down God, discouraged, depressed, wounded. I pray tonight that the truth of your word would wash every heart, would lift every head. I pray tonight, God, that your word, like a, a life preserver, would buoy their life, that they would cling to and hold fast to that which is true. I pray, God, that you would infuse them with strength tonight, that you'd lift up the feeble hands that are hanging down and strengthen those knees, God, that hands might be raised and praised and, and feet and legs would begin once again to walk with you. I pray, Father, please, that you'd bind us together. God, that you'd knit our hearts together as one. I, I pray if there's broken relationships, I pray if there's bitterness or unforgiveness. I pray, God, if there are grievances that we've been bearing against each other, that before we even bring the gift to the altar, Lord, we leave it there and be reconciled to our brother or to our sister. I pray, God, that, that this part of your church, this local body, Lord, we'd be all that you want us to be, that we would live out the fullness of your life that you've given to us through Christ, your Son. I pray, God, that we'd never become an old wineskin. I pray, God, that you'd keep our hearts fresh and new, hungry for you. I pray, God, that we'd always be astonished that we're your sons, that we're your daughters. I pray, God, in that place you'd fill us with new wine. I pray, Father, please, that our lives would be filled to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. God, that this would be a place of life where Christ is at the center. God, we were overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed with all that you've done in our lives. We thank you, God, that you've made us to be beautiful. Tonight, as our eyes are closed and as our heads are bowed, listen, this evening, if you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, and this, by the way, is what Christianity is. Christianity is all about Jesus. It's not about institutionalism in the church. It's not about man's traditions. It's not about religion. It's not about moral perfection in your life. It's about you recognizing your deep and desperate need. It's about you seeing as the Spirit of God brings illumination and conviction that you, just like me, have sinned against God. And you need those offenses and transgressions forgiven. You need to be adopted into the family of God. You need to be made beautiful by the hands of Jesus. You need to leave this place tonight with the assurance of everlasting life. Listen, all of this can be yours. If tonight you would believe, if tonight you would trust completely in the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so tonight, listen, if this is you, if you've never taken this step of faith, and, and tonight life for you may be miserable, it may be dark, it may be ugly, your life may be filled with sin, tonight God will receive you just as you are just as you are. You don't have to fix a thing. All you have to do is come to Jesus. He will do the fixing. And so tonight, if this is you, if God is speaking to your heart, I don't want you leaving this place without an opportunity to be adopted into God's family, to be filled with the Spirit, and to be forgiven of your sins. And so tonight, if He is knocking on the door of your heart, if He's speaking to you, you'd say, Derek, that's me. I want Jesus in my life. I need Him. I see now that He is the answer. 
I want to believe in his sacrifice and his resurrection that he did that for me. I want his power in my life. Tonight, if this is you, I want to pray for you and I'm going to ask you right where you're sitting, would you raise your hand tonight? Would you stretch your hand up high this evening as God is speaking to your heart? Just acknowledge this evening, tonight, you want to step out in faith. You tonight want to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is you this evening. Stretch that hand up high. Let me see who you are. God, we're thankful, hearts filled with joy. Receive now our praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys tonight. Hey, thank Dominic for coming. And Jay, thank you guys.